Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's session of Ready for Pre-K. My name is Lauren Brown, and I'm the Director of Family Services for the Early Childhood Education Division. Our session this evening is the third and final session in our series with Dr. Tracy Baxley, Stronger Together, Moving from Fear-Based Parenting to Social Justice Parenting. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items that I want to go over with the group. We're using Zoom, tonight, Zoom webinar for tonight's session. Throughout the session, we invite you to enter your comments, questions into the Q&A. Please note that these will only be seen by the hosts and moderators like myself and not to the entire group. Florence and I will be moderating the chat this evening and we will pull questions to raise up to Dr. Baxley throughout the presentation during the Q&A portion and at the end. This session will be recorded and posted on the DCPS YouTube page. So for that reason, we've disabled um, the microphones and camera features for our guests. If you need tech support during tonight's session, you can use the chat. We're offering simultaneous interpretation in Spanish. So I'm going to pause for a quick announcement for those who would like to use the interpretation feature. Florence. Thank you, Lauren. Gracias, familias. Bienvenidas a, a nuestras familias que hablan español. Buenas tardes, buenas noches. Sí, esta noche tenemos interpretación en español. Si ustedes han unido con nosotros en, por su computadora, lo que tienen que hacer es presionar en ese icono abajo del que dice Interpretation. Um, se parece como un globo en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Entonces van a presionar ahí ese icono del globito y después presionan Spanish para español y también Mute Um, esa oración que dice mute original audio, que significa que ustedes van a, van a estar silenciados para silenciar a todos los demás idiomas. Entonces, así pueden, pueden um, hacer el requisito para la interpretación. Si ustedes están usando un, su teléfono, su celular, o si están en una tableta como en un iPad, entonces lo que ustedes hacen es presionen en los tres puntitos que dicen more, también que está abajo en la, en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Um, ahí ustedes tienen la opción que va a decir language interpretation, que eh, significa interpretación del lenguaje. Presionen español y también hacen lo mismo en, del mute original audio para silenciar en, el resto del audio y va a silenciar el inglés para que ustedes puedan escucharlo en español. Thank you, Florence. We like to start all of our Ready for Pre-K sessions with some general community agreements. We are committed to making sure that this is a forum where people feel safe, welcomed, and respected. So we ask that you please be kind, be patient, and be open to learning. I'm going to pass it over to Florence to get us started. Thank you, Lauren. As you can see here, this is... Um... So you'll see our DCPS becoming purpose statement. DC Public Schools is committed to becoming an anti-racist school district. And um, with you joining, we know that this means that you're committed to becoming anti-racist families. This work does take all of us. And we know that families are children's first and most important teachers. We believe that conversations about race and equity should be happening at home for all children even before they begin school. We believe that conversations about race should start early. They should happen often. They recognize and celebrate differences. They build a positive sense of self and identity. And we normalize conversations about race from an early age. We are so excited to have Dr. Tracy Baxley here with us this evening. She's the perfect person to have this help us with this conversation. She's a mother, an educator, an um, advocate of, around belonging, and an author of the book, Social Justice Parenting, How to Raise Compassionate, Anti-Racist, Justice-Minded justice Kids in an Unjust World. Welcome back, Dr. Baxley. We're so excited that you're with us again. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was just saying before we went live that I feel like I'm part of the family. So I want to make sure I continue to stay in touch with what you guys are doing. It's such a beautiful thing to uh, have a whole school district that, that is focused on, on raising more inclusive anti-racist children. So I am um, excited to be a part of this and um, can't wait to see where you guys go. All right, I am going to share my screen. I'm not sure. Oh, here we go. Okay. All right, I am gonna share my screen now and um, pop up my PowerPoint. Okay, we should be good now, right? Everybody's good? Yep, looks great. All right, awesome. So it's, like I said, it's really been a pleasure to be here and be a part of the movement that you guys are really creating. And um, I want to kind of go backwards before we go forward. I want to discuss a little bit about um, the, the, the first two sessions. The first sessions, we really kind of discussed this idea of being, an, being allies, like what that looks like and the importance of that. Um, the second session, we talked about how we navigate uh, racial socialization from the resistance of black joy. And so tonight I really want us to talk about how we can, as parents, right? All of us, how we can parent from the lens of social justice parenting, um, whether we're parents, educators, or really any adult who is uh, supporting or in the lives of children. So in the previous presentations, we part of the talk was about how fear-based parenting can sometimes really get in the way of us being more inclusive and more intentional with the way that we parent. So what I'd like to ask to start off is, you know, asking some kind of big, big idea questions. Um, what if we could learn to control our fears instead of allowing our fears to control the way we parent? What if we can um, like lean into those fears in ways that we not only support our kids, but we support the community. What if there's a way that we can parent from the lens of our children's curiosity instead of our parenting being driven by our own limited um, ways of thinking or our own anxieties and fears. So, and I think a way that we can do that really um, is through this idea of social justice parenting. I think through social justice parenting, we can become stronger as families and we can be stronger as, as, as a community. So here's the roadmap that we're gonna to follow today, um, tonight. Uh, we're going to, first of all, review the ways that we reinforce this fear-based parenting with our children. We wanna kind of put that on the table and talk about it just for a minute to remind ourselves. And then we wanna to start to think about how we can replace that fear-based parenting with the idea of radical love. So we'll talk about what is radical love and what components do we need to think about in this encompassing kind of love. And then we'll move, we'll use this idea of radical love to really engage us in social justice parenting. Particularly, we'll talk about the rocks, which are the building blocks of social justice parenting. And mixed in those introduction of the rocks, we will um, give at least one action item that we can do, right? So it's it's, one thing to learn and to grow, but if we're not putting it into action, um, we don't start to see the change in the end. So I'll give you one idea that you can do um, for each of the items, um, each building block in the rocks. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we embark on this third workshop, um, I want to remind you of the ways that we talked about how fear lead, can lead our parenting journey. Um, so the first way that we talked about in, in, in one of the other sessions is that um, parents stay in fear by keeping their kids in this protective bubble, right? That bubble that we create our kids, we realize is really a false protection that in the end, it really does more hurt than it does helping um, in the long run. Um, we also talked about that sometimes our fear may show up in silence, right? That we don't wanna talk about race or other hard topics with our kids. So we choose to ignore it or admit these uh, issues uh, in the conversations that we're having with our children or our family. Sometimes our fear can be disguised in the, we don't see color ideology, right? That's that color blindness. 
we talked about how dangerous that really is. And when you ignore color, you are essentially ignoring the lived experience and the racial inequities really that we see that exist in the world. So no more colorblind ideology moving forward. And then finally, in our second session, we really talked about how black families fear show up really in the form of the talk. That conversation that black parents have with their children about race um, often is a way of covering our children with the psychological armor really to help them survive outside the safety of our own homes. And the talk is really about how, how to live safely in their black skin within a racialized society. So those are our fears that we talked about. And those are the fears that often lead us in our parenting. And so we don't wanna live in that space anymore. We wanna move beyond the fear and beyond, be, moving beyond that fear really starts with the idea of, of radical love. So I, I wanna say that social justice parenting itself is I think is the antidote to, to fear-based parenting. If we are moving in the direction of social justice parenting, it will really remove some of these ways that we show up in fear and anxiety when we're raising our kids. But social justice parenting has to start with this idea of all the ideas that are associated with radical love. So what, what is radical love? Radical love is an unconditional, compassionate love that expands beyond the four walls of your homes, right? So it's, it goes beyond loving um, and taking care of the people that live with you. Radical love really involves being open-hearted, open-minded. It's a willingness to learn from people whose experiences and ideas and cultures are different from yours. And that also includes being open to learning from your children, right? Our kids can teach us so much about the world from their perspective if we're open um, and we're in tune with listening to it. Radical love it also asks us to lean into our own vulnerabilities, right? To lead with our hearts, to be present, and to be intentional in our parenting practices. The more our kids can see us vulnerable, it teaches them to be vulnerable in the way that they show up. It teaches them that they can um, have big feelings and work through those big feelings. Um, radical love is also committed to the struggle of others and requires us to show up for others um, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult. Um, and in that showing up, we expect nothing in return, right? So it's this unconditional love for the community, for the world, for people who are different from us, people who are marginalized. And it's fueled by this idea of compassion and understanding um, in a way that it pr promotes healing and growth. Social justice parents, I mean, radical love also and changes, it challenges us to look at our own biases, right? to expand our narrow ways of thinking, to be opening to learning and seeing things from a different perspective. It's a willingness to actively listen and the capacity to speak up and take risks that not just benefit ourselves, but benefit our community. And lastly, it's action-based, right? Radical love is not just a, um, it's, it's a verb, right? It's a being, it's a doing. Um, it, it, it's action oriented, it's community focused, and it really creates spaces of belonging for everyone. Um, and we want to be more expansive and we wanna teach our children to be more expansive in the way that they show up for each other. So when we think of fear-based parenting, it's more limited, um, it's more um, contractive, um, and it's really a, a place of thinking only about your own kids, what's good for your own children. But when you, when you lean into the idea of radical love, it makes us grow. It, it's more expansive. It's limitless love. And when you lean in, lean into radical love, it really is about how can I show up, not just for my own children, but how do I show up for other people's children as well? So we can't do any of these things if we're parenting from a place of fear. We, sometimes we're, we're afraid of the unknown. We're afraid of each other. We're afraid of getting things wrong. Um, we're afraid of change. But we have to walk into our parenting covered in radical love so that we are not passing down those same fears to our children. Um, we want our children to be curious. We want them to be open. We want them to um, think about things in ways that they're, they're not uh, limited by their, by their fears. And we, one way to do that is really kind of parenting and walking through this idea of radical love. 
So social justice parenting really is birthed out of the idea of radical love. It's about being intentional and purposeful in the way that we're raising our children to care deeply, to love radically, and to show up for themselves and to show up for others in really authentic ways. But social justice, justice, social justice parenting also means that you not only want what's good for your kids, but you want what's good for all children. And you really take action, right, toward making the world better for, for others. It involves modeling and taking action um, to change the things that often marginalize, hurt, or stereotype other peoples. And through building the building blocks of social justice parenting, we can really raise the next generation of leaders, right? The humans that will be more inclusive and more and create more positive change in the world. And so I really want to, to kind of dig a little bit into the building blocks of social justice parents, which I call the rocks. It's about reflection, open dialogue, compassion, kindness, and social engagement. So how do we begin to move beyond the fear to really nurture and model the qualities that we really wanna pass on to our kids, those qualities that we want to instill in our children so when they are adults and they're away from us, they are still um, showing up for other people. And the only way that they can really do that is by watching what we do and internalizing the examples that we set in our, in our homes as they're as they're young, um, as they are um, young young children. Um, so the foundations of of um, social justice parenting are the building blocks of the rocks. Um, I want to talk a little bit about each of these, um, what what it means, and how we can engage in each of them um, in our daily parenting life. So I would like for us to go through the rocks. Um, but before we go through each rock, I really want each part of the rocks, I want to ask you to look at it from this idea of these three different lenses. So how do the rocks require me to be better in, in these different areas? So look at what we're talking about, the second half of this um, presentation from the lens of yourself, right? How do the rocks require me to be a better person? Or how do these different parts of the rocks require me to do some introspection of myself, of my parenting, um, or as me as a human being? Um, if you're looking at the rocks through the lens of family, how do I show up for my children? Thinking about the rocks, right? And how do I teach them through the rocks, right? What, am, what are the examples that I'm set, setting? How am I modeling that? And how am I treating them when I look at my parenting through the social justice parenting rocks? And then finally, through the lens of community. So how is my family using the rocks to engage, to support, to build in my community? Um, so if you look at self, family, and community as we're going through the next slides, I want you to be kind of proactive in thinking about what that looks like for you, what that looks like for your family, and what does that look like for your community in terms of what you can add um, to make your community better. So let's start with R. R is for reflection. Now, there is no single aspect of social justice parenting that's more important than the other, <coughs> excuse me, but reflection is really the first of the rocks because you really can't engage in the practice of raising a generation of social conscious children without really thinking about your own childhood, right? Your own personal experiences, your own ways of thinking, because all of that is gonna impact the way you show up as a parent. So reflection is really a way that we grow as humans. And I think it's really important that we ask questions. We ask ourselves, how have my experiences, my fears, um, my identities, my childhood, family really impacted the way impact the way that I show up in the world? And how have all of these things really impacted the way that I show up for my children? And that self-reflection is really a practice that really nurtures and enhances our understanding of who we are, um, how we became who we are, and the, why we think and act the way that we do. So when you spend time with your own thoughts and feelings, um, your own emotions and behaviors and questions, um, questioning yourself, what do I do and why do I do it the way I do it, right? It gives you a clear picture of yourself and your values and how to align that, how to align those truths really with the way that you wanna show up with your children. 
So reflecting on our behaviors and our thoughts will really allow us to see what we need to work on. And the more that we can reflect on what we need to work on, um, the more intentional we'll be in our parenting. So asking yourself, how can I begin to be more intentional, to make more intentional changes in my life that really align with the core values that I want to raise my children with is really one of the major questions you ask, ask yourself when you're doing some of that reflection. And we also know that self-reflection really supports our ability to learn, to relearn and unlearn the things that, that we may hold as truths right now. I um, mean, it also empowers us to build emotional self-awareness through our critical examination and questions that really lead to self-improvement. And if we are improving the way that we show up for ourselves, we're doing that with the way we show up for our children and uh, eventually the way our family can show up for the community. So if you wanna show up with others, show up for others in a more authentic and thoughtful way, you have to be willing to engage in the reflection that it takes to get there. So uh, when I'm working with my clients and um, one of the activities that I have in the book is really, I encourage uh, readers and clients to, to complete this three, two, one reflection activity. Um, this really helps you to really begin to think about um, how your current practices as a parent, um, is it what you really want? And then how to, to support yourself intentionally making the changes in the areas that you need to improve. So the first thing is that you're gonna list three things that you do well in your daily uh, parenting practices that really bring you joy and bring your children joy. So what are the three things that I'm doing very well that I wanna keep, that I wanna keep raising my kids with, that I would love for my kids to take with them um, that's positive when they start to raise their own families. Um, really list those three things out so that you can be real, really intentional about that. And then the two is, list two things that you do as a parent that you wanna change, right? So there's some things in your own ch childhood that may come up um, that you don't wanna to, want to continue. I'm thinking in terms of my own childhood, um, my parents as most black parents uh, during this uh, 70s and 80s were, um, spanking was normal, right? When I began to have kids, I decided that I didn't wanna spank my children. And so that was a, a conscious decision that I made, but it took me to practice that to get better at it because um, when you're raised one way, right, it becomes your go-to when you when you're parent. So that was one of the things that I was very conscious about um, when I became a parent. Another thing that I, and I, I changed as a mom when I became a parent that was different from my own parent. Um, when I was growing up, children were, um, not really allowed to voice their opinions, right? You know, it was because I said so as an adult or because I'm the parent. And that was also something that I didn't want to continue with my own children. So I was very intentional about changing the way that I allowed my kids to have voice in my house or have an opinion or share in some of the decision-making. So those are some things that you really want to think about. What am I doing today that I really want to change? What are the things that I'm doing that I want to get better at or, or do differently. And then the one thing is create an action plan around one of those things, right? So if it's about the way I may scream at my kids or whatever that is, what's the one thing that I can do that can trigger me to change those things when it happens? And just so we, when you're looking at changes, no action is too small. Small things over time, right, make big differences. So if your action is very small and is a baby step forward, it is still a step forward. So don't be afraid um, to engage in small steps that you don't have to do it all at once. Um, as parents, we are also going to show up for our kids in not so perfect ways, right? Because we are not perfect and we're raising not perfect people. And so one of the other actions that I <coughs> encourage parents to do is to reflect on their own behaviors with their kids. So let's say I said I wasn't going to scream at my children when I got uh, frustrated. Um, and that's something that I want to change. And so when I scream at my kids, I the first thing you want to do, the R in the reflect, reflecting cycle, is to reflect on your, on your response. So you really want to think about what made me scream? Why did I do that? Um, what was that action that I did that I want to change? Because studies really show that children who have parents who are affected at, at uh, reflection, 
they grow up to be more secure and grounded and they're better at problem solving. And so once we reflect on our responses, you want to then e evaluate how, how you're feeling. So sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, if I'm screaming at my kids, it has nothing to do with them. It's because I'm hungry. It could be because I'm stressed about a deadline at work. So you really want to evaluate how you're feeling in that moment and name those feelings that trigger that um, behavior that you no longer want to do. Make sure that there's an accurate alignment with what's coming out of your mouth, right? what you're really feeling. Um, and it's important for us to do that so we can separate the way, the way we're responding to our kids and really um, the way that uh, we're really feeling in those moments. And the F is find out how your response makes your children feel. So you always need to circle back and don't be afraid to ask your kid, how did, how did me screaming at you, what did that make you feel like? Um, and, and, and be okay with apologizing, right? I'm sorry that I, I screamed at you. That's not something I wanna do. That's not aligned with our core values of our house. I need to find a way to make sure I'm talking to you more um, in, in a, uh, you know, a, a better way. Um, and this way you're also giving them the tools and the vocabulary that they need to reflect on and identify deeper, more nuanced emotions and feelings. And it starts with really you being able to name your own feelings. And the L is for to lean into your family's core values. So I'm really big on establishing core values in your home. I think it's, super important. Um, and I think kids can be a part of that, right? So you want to name core values, talk about what those are, what the things that are important to your family. Because when you're screaming or when you are doing something that's out of alignment with who you want to be and the way you want to raise your children, those core values are like your GPS, right? They bring you back when you get off track and they really support you in realigning what's really important to you. So make sure that you have core values that are essential to your family and that you, you, you parent through those core values. And then the E is for explore ways that you can respond differently in the future. So this is where like things like this help, right? They give you more ideas, it gives you more tools for your parenting toolbox. Um, don't be afraid to seek out support, right? To navigate in different spaces that you're not familiar with in order to grow and to learn so that you know how to undo the things that you no longer wanna carry on um, in, your, in your family practices. The C is for capture time for a little grace and to catch your breath, right? So sometimes we're very hard on ourselves when we're not showing up as a perfect parent, but reflecting on that and reflecting on the fact that you're going to make mistakes, right? Some of them will be small mistakes. Some of them will be ginormous mistakes, but especially on the journey of raising children who kind of stand up for themselves, it is a learning curve. And we have to find moments that we give ourselves a little bit of peace where we can kind of breathe through things when we don't show up as our best selves. And then the T is really for take action. So now that we've looked at all these previous steps, then what will be our next action? How do we then show up in a way that we are continuing our social justice parenting journey? Um, and this cycle continues every time we don't show up as our best selves. Okay? So those are two kind of action items that you could do when you're thinking about the idea of reflection. So the O in open, the O in the rocks is open dialogue. And open dialogue really requires us to have the courage to be vulnerable and to be honest with our children um, and really open and vulnerable and honest with ourselves too. Um, sometimes this means checking our egos at the door, right? Saying that we're wrong, saying we didn't do things right, telling our kids that we messed up. Um, it's important that we do those kinds of things. Um, and social justice parenting really requires us to maintain this open dialogue with our children, which means you have to, time, have to take time to actively listen and to validate your kids' voices because if we're not taking the time to allow them to use their voices and to learn their voices in our homes, they're not gonna be able to do that out in the world. And we wanna raise children who are able to stand up for themselves um, and advocate for others too. Um, we know that children often ask questions that Sometimes as parents, we're not always comfortable with answering and we're not always prepared to answer. But if we are addressing the hard topics, it really actually makes your children feel safer. And I know it doesn't, it sounds counter, counterintuitive, but it really gives them some control over the messaging that, that they're receiving. And it gives them a safe place to ask the questions and to get those questions answer, answered. So um, you are really unpacking like scary and unfamiliar topic, topics in a very safe space. So the open, open dialogue 
everybody has a space to tell the truth. Um, and it's not really one person depositing their knowledge and ideas into another one, uh, another person. Um, as parents, we often do that. But instead, it's really this idea of exchanging ideas, exchanging concerns, and exchanging energies, right, that foster growth and change and allows us to really understand our kids better. So it's about speaking and listening with courage, with humility, and with this idea of active hope. So one of the most frequent questions that I get asked um, in, in working with parents and working with families is, um, you know, what is the most what, what is the uh, appropriate age to start talking about any of these hard topics, right? Race, sex, death, um, social, sexual orientation, all of these things. But having hard and honest conversations with our children is really an opportunity for our children to, to, to lead and to lean into their own natural curiosities, right? I don't think kids are ever too young. It's just a matter of how we're gonna talk with them about it. Um, and again, going back to that fear, right? If fear is preventing you from speaking to your kids about hard things, you need to think about how you reframe that fear because you really should be more afraid of the message your children are receiving in the outside world about the things that you're afraid to talk about. So hearing it from you really makes it better and makes it easier. And you are teaching them from your own values um, and not the values of other people. So there's a few things that we can do. Again, action, when we talk about the action of open dialogue, there's a few things that we can do to kind of set the stage for um, beginning the open dialogue with our children. And really this, this also can go for open dialogue that we wanna have with people in our community that are different from us, right? When we're starting to, to learn about others and we want to be more engaged, we wanna stand with and be allies with others. Um, it, this is great for that too. So the first thing is to be honest and vulnerable, right? Open dialogue is really about having the courage to have these hard conversations, even when you're afraid, right? So you're gonna get it wrong and that's okay, but it's about being honest about that. Um, it's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. So it's particularly imperative that without judgment, you acknowledge what your child is feeling. So being critical of what they're saying or the questions that are answered is, is a way to really stop them from engaging in open dialogue. So you want to be careful about the way you say what you say. Um, it's also important as you begin to set the stage for open dialogue, it's to be curious and be open to learning, right? Your lived experiences impact the way you interpret current events and social issues, but that goes for the people that you're talking to as well, whether it's your children or whether it's people in the community. So be open to hearing other people's perspective and learning about differences. Um, you're not gonna always have the answers. Um, you can't be an expert on everything, right? You may only know one perspective on a topic, but don't let that really stop you from engaging in open dialogue with uh, your family and the community because the way we grow, the way we really lean into radical love is about learning other people's stories. Um, and then finally, you want to follow up and take action. So most conversations, especially those that are centered around major events or social justice topics, they will happen over time. Um, so it's good to follow up on these things to clarify any misinformation, um, any gaps that your kids may have on a topic because they're not gonna get it all at once. And you're, conversation when you are um, learning, it's not going to be the best conversation you have, and you're going to have to come back and clean up some of the things that you say, too. Um, and, and, and the same with your community. Maybe you're showing up in a way that you're trying to learn. You may some, say something that offend, that may offend someone else, but it doesn't mean that you stop, right? You come back, you ask more questions, and you learn from your mistakes. So when you are actually engaging in open dialogue with your kids, it's really good to facilitate a positive conversation by um, thinking about these five things, right? Being sensitive, right? So you're sharing your feelings in a real tender and open manner where your kids are open and vulnerable. You wanna make sure it's age appropriate, right? So you wanna break down hard topics in their simplest form. You don't wanna dumb it down, but you wanna break it down so that you're telling all of the truths, but you're telling in a way that they can understand. Um, you want to be sincere, right? You want to be truthful. You want to be honest. Even when you don't know the answers, that's something to be honest about too. Um, and even if it's hard or hurtful, you still want to be honest and truthful. Um, the next thing is you want to contextualize it. So you want to offer like any appropriate background information or shared examples 
that you could draw from their own lives that would make the connection for them. That makes it more concrete. Um, and it makes it so that they can understand what you're teaching them or is talking with them about better. And then the final thing is leaning in with their own curiosities, right? Don't let your fears and anxiety, again, be the entry point for those open dialogues, but let their curiosity and the questions that they ask you and the things that they want to know be the lead you in those conversations. And then also, I think another action that you can take when it comes to open dialogue is really leading your conversations with open-ended questions or statements, right? I think it's really a great way to find out what your kid already knows and to keep the communication going. So these are a few of the ones that I use with my own kids. And these are also some of the ones that I put in the book to help parents to get started, you know, asking your kid, you know, thank you for sharing, tell me more. How do you think that, how you think you would feel if that happened to you? Uh, what have we learned from that? What can our family do to make these changes? Those types of open-ended questions so that your kids can grow in the conversation and they can use problem-solving skills and good listening skills and empathy to really begin to dig deeper into the conversations that you're having about hard topics, particularly you know, race-based conversations. And then the C in rocks is compassion. So compassion is that moment or that feeling that comes between being confronted with someone suffering and taking action to relieve it. So it's that moment between recognizing that somebody is hurting and doing something about it. And that's really where compassion sits. Um, it's really about accepting our own flaws and imperfections as a part of humanity, right? When we're talking about self-compassion, Remember, we're looking from those three lenses of self, family, and community. Um, and research really shows us that when we feel compassion, our heart rate literally slows down and our brain's reward center begins to light up. So when we are raising kids in compassionate homes, these are places where our children's voices and their feelings are prioritized. Um, Compassion is not something that we tell our kids. Instead, it's really how we show up every day in our behaviors and our action. Um, so for example, if your kids make mistakes, right? If they spill the milk or if they drew on the wall when they were, or on the floor when they were coloring, how is that mistake treated in your home? Do you show up in compassion? Do you show up in frustration or anger, right? Um, so mistakes really create an opportunity to build capacity for compassion in our daily lives. And we know with little ones, things, their help often turns into non-help, but how do we show up for them in those moments? Um, and it's really important that we really think about that and we try to show up in a way that starts with compassion. Um, your children need to also feel that you forgive them, right? And that each day they can start over um, if they're having a bad day. Compassion in the community really means how we come together around these common ideas of seeing each other, trying to understand each other's lived experiences in ways that really open, opens our hearts and our minds. Um, and we know in our current political and social climate, it's really crucial for us to remain compassionate. Um, if we don't acknowledge the pain and hurt that continues to plague people in our country and really in our country in general, we'll continue to cycle through it. So when we teach our kids to be, to respond to others with compassion, um, it helps them to, to honor the sacredness of every human being. And it ripples through our through the universe, really, right? It's contagious. So let's remember that we need to show up in self-compassion first. And this is where a lot of us have problems, right? Overall, people are significantly kinder and more compassion to others than they are to themselves. So for women, 86% of women are more compassionate to others than they are to themselves. And the study shows that 67% of men are. So we have a lot of work to do on ourselves because it is that, it is the root of that, that really that our kids are watching to learn how to treat themselves and to treat others. So self-compassion is really this practice and this way of thinking that really allows us to be more supportive of ourselves that really then opens up a way for you to be more kind and compassionate to others. Um, it's about how we think about ourselves in ways, how we talk to ourselves, right? Practicing this positive self-talk is really important. And it really is a powerful tool in 
uh, positive coping and resiliency. And that, those are the kinds of things that we want to send to our kids or lead to our kids. Um, when I make a mistake in my own parenting, I have this mean girl inside of me that will tell me that I'm a bad mom or remind me of the mistakes I made. And I really have to work on that, that self-compassionate voice to drown out the mean girl voice inside of me and to be able to forgive myself um, and make better choices the next time, right? Using that reflective cycle that we talked about a little bit earlier. So that radical love that we're talking about giving to others and giving to your family, it's really important that it starts with you giving it to yourself. And this is something that sometimes people don't wanna hear, but setting appropriate boundaries is really a act of compassion for your children. Um, we have to create boundaries around our own selves, around our kids. Um, research shows us that children who grow up with a sense of entitlement, right? So those are the parents who are in those protective bubbles, right? That who are overprotecting, overindulging, overpurchasing. They are more concerned about themselves and they show less compassion and empathy for others. So showing compassion for your kids really may look like you just saying no. So really enforce boundaries when your kids are having temper tantrums or having some negative behaviors as a result of you saying no. Um, stick to your ground, right? You could say things like, I see you're disappointed that you couldn't get that treat at the store. I know you're angry um, that you couldn't play on those video games right now. So you want to acknowledge those feelings, but you want to hold your boundaries because when you acknowledge your feelings, you are showing empathy and you're all showing compassion for them in the moment of them needing those, those feelings, but you still have to hold your boundaries and when you say no. Um, not to worry about being liked. You know, I, I see a lot of parents that want to be liked by their kids. Um, there are gonna be times in, in your kids' lives that their job is to not like you and that's okay, that's developmentally okay. Um, and that's part of parenting. So don't let those negative behaviors or the need to test your boundaries uh, determine the rules of your house, right? Don't compromise on your core values. And then this idea of finding gratitude when kids don't get what they want. It really is uh, a time where they learn to be grateful when they do get it. And then they appreciate it more. And then they develop more compassion for those who don't have. Um, when they don't have it, they realize that, you know, everybody doesn't get this or that I have. And they, they become a little bit more compassionate for those, uh, for other people. And then finally, with compassion, um, with the community, right? Compassion in the community means that really we come together around these common ideas of seeing each other and trying to understand each other's experiences. It's really the root of all social justice work, this compassion um, and compassionate communities. So um, when our kids see us doing this, the habit of that, they will learn and they will begin to do it too. So think about how you can be of service to others, how taking small steps is good enough, um, being a change agent in your community um, and really teaching our kids to see the humanity in, in each other. And then the K in the rocks is kindness. So kindness, I see kind, kindness is compassion and action. So it's having those feelings of, about others, but then it's, it's taking it the next step and actually doing something. And it really is a powerful tool to really overcome society's greatest challenges. There was a 2014 Harvard study that talked about um, the children we meant, we meant to raise. And basically 80% of the, of the children thought that the most, um, the values that, they, that their children, uh, that they most value were compassion and kindness. Um, and in 2020, a parent study looked at it from a parent's perspective and a parent's perspective, um, the most important trait that they hope to cultivate in their kids was kindness. And so kids were um, receiving the messages of kindness as not important as getting straight A's or, or being the best at uh, soccer or whatever those things are. And we have to make sure the messages that we think are important are really translating to, to the way we show up in our kids. So the one interesting thing that about kindness that I wanted to say before we move on is that um, when, this, when you look at studies and you look at um, people um, studying kindness, it shows that you don't even have to be involved in kindness in order for your body to respond to, to kindness. So just watching people engage in kindness 
has the same neurological impacts as it is being a recipient of or a giver of kindness. So each act of kindness really produces these waves that are really beyond our consciousness. So the more that we are spreading kindness, receiving kindness, or simply just witnessing kindness, the results are all the same, right? It facilitates more kindness. So the more we are using kindness for ourselves, we're using kindness in the way we're raising our kids, and we're using kindness to foster a sense of community. Um, the research shows that we really are raising children who um, will have the capacity to do that as they as they grow older. Um, and then sometimes when we have little ones or, or even our teens, really, we, we want to get them involved in intentional acts of kindness. And sometimes we get overwhelmed by the thought of that, but really it doesn't take a lot to spread kindness. And um, these examples of micro kindness really are just ways that you can do little things that don't cost you anything, but it changes the disposition of the person that are that's getting the kindness. It changes you because you feel like you've done something kind. Um, and it also changes anybody who's witnessing that. I don't know if you've ever noticed when you're driving, if you let someone in, right, cut in front of you, you'll see like down the road, maybe two lights down the road, that same person would also let somebody in. So it really does have this kind of rippling impact. Um, a couple of the things that we did in our house to facilitate kindness is we kept a kindness jar. So when every, everybody did something kind to someone else, they would put it in the jar. And then Sundays during dinner time, we would take out some of those kindness acts and we would read them out loud. And this facilitated um, great conversations. And then it left everybody the next week wanting to have more things in the kindness jar. So it's just a, a way of being mindful of building kindness as a habit in, our, in your home. Um, and we're teaching our kids, really, if we teach our kids to sprinkle kindness, I say sprinkle it like confetti, right? And then watch how it changes your family and watch how it changes your community. And then the last rock, part of the rocks is social engagement. So this is a final building block of social justice parenting. And it is undeniable, right, that the current social political environment is heavy, it's complex, and it's layered. We were talking about this before we started uh, recording tonight, and I find myself talking to my kids a lot about issues in equity, race, discrimination, human dignity, and we talk about it, um, how it's necessary for them to be to be able to use their voices as change agents in the world. And we know it's not always easy, but when we give our kids chances to practice that at home, it becomes easier for them to do it out in the world. So um, have those conversations, really lean into what your family can do um, as a group to, to promote social engagement. Um, if we look back in history, really young activists really have been at the heart of social progress for decades. When you look at the civil rights movements, gun control, environmental issues, um, girls' rights to education. You, we can name young leaders who really are at the forefront of all of these major issues. So social justice parenting is really about how we raise children who are proactive in recognizing injustices and who feel really the need to respond and to, to act on these things. So when we begin to create safe spaces in our own house where our kids belong and they feel like they have voice, our children will grow up to be able to create those same kind of spaces out in the world. So it's really up to us to guide them, um, to stand up for others, to speak out against inequities, um, and simply view these ideas as something normal, right? Normal behavior that we're doing that. Um, it's not something great, it's not something spectacular, it's just what we do. And the more that we're able to model these things, um, the more your kids feel comfortable at pushing back against status quo um, when it, and it becomes a habit um, that leads to activism, right? That activism becomes normalized in, in your kids' lives. Um, uh, and again, I'm gonna go back to the idea that it's never too early to start, right? And so we can get our kids involved in volunteering right away, right? And showing how one act can really impact the world around them. Um, and I know a lot of agencies and organizations have a minimal age, right? Where kids can actually come and take part. But you can do these things that are called portable projects in your own homes where you're packing backpacks, right? Or you're collecting feminine hygiene um, items for a shelter or baby uh, objects or items for, your kids can help in doing that. And although they're not out in the community, the work that they're doing inside your home will really 
be impactful to the community. And you could talk your kids through that as you're collecting these things and you're creating artwork that can be sent to children in the hospital. You know, your kids can be involved in that, making book marker, uh, markers for um, books that you're sending out to, to low socioeconomic preschools and things like that. So your kids can be a part of all of that and you can start that as young as, as, as um, you know, two and three. So on this page here, I kind of divided it up into two categories. No category is, is more important than the other. It's just about some things take less time and less energy and some take more time and energy. So think about how any of these things can align with some of the things that you want to do in your own home and the way that you can show up for your kids. I know when, when my oldest son was probably about eight, he was seeing that a lot of the trees um, in our neighborhood, um, in our community, were being cut down to build more townhouses or whatever. And, he, and it really bothered him. And so I encouraged him to write a letter to the mayor and we walked down to city hall. We gave the letter to the mayor's secretary. And although we never heard back from the mayor, which I was very disappointed that we wouldn't at least get like a standard letter, um, he felt empowered by doing that. And so we can start these kinds of acts very early with our kids so that our kids really can know that um, every good thing that they do really sends positive vibrations in the world. And um, the things that they do can make a difference no matter how, how small they are. And so I wanna end with just saying the world needs you, right? The world needs your kids. The, the world needs you to raise your children who really believe that they can make a difference by using their own power and their own voices for positive change. And I think the rocks of social justice parenting can really help support you in your journey and raising leaders in our world, leaders who are inclusive, leaders who are anti-racist, leaders who are more compassionate and kind. And I hope that you'll walk away from this really thinking about one step or one action that you can take with your kids, with your family, in your community that would take you a little bit further on your journey, no matter where you are um, in your social justice parenting to walk. Okay, so I will um, stop there. And if anybody had, um, you know, we could do a Q and A session at this point. We did have some questions that were submitted and that um, during registration and also during the uh, chat while you were while you were talking. So I'll share okay. a couple of those if you don't mind. Someone seems to have really connected with the comment you made pretty early on um, about how um, you know norms in black families and you know generations past. So if you could talk a little bit about um, what does the research say over the last 15 years? about thinking and physical punishment as an effective disciplinary <coughs> method for black children? Yeah, I think the, the research is showing that it's not effective, um, that what we're doing, we're raising more aggressive kids um, because especially when they're young, when they're two and they're three and they're four, they don't recognize, uh, they can't departmentalize when hitting is okay and when it's not okay, right? And so I think the research is really showing us that um, the more that we are able to find other ways that we're dealing with our kids, the way that we are um, using other consequences. Um, and, and, and I'm gonna go back a little bit too, you know, when we look at school suspension, right? Um, school disciplinary issues, it's our black boys that are, having more issues with that, right? And our, our black girls are second. So I think if we look at the way that we are disciplining our kids at home, it may have something to do with the way they're showing up and the way that people are perceiving our children, um, our black children in ways that um, may not be right, um, but, but we're seeing that there is a um, bias that, that, that people have with our children. And a lot of it is a cultural, uh, a cultural way of, that our kids are showing up. Like our kids are sometimes more animated, right? It's part of our culture. Um, and, I, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the way that we talked with our kids, we empower our children um, in our homes, the way that we have consequences for our children when they are um, not, their behaviors are not align, aligning with our core values. I think we need to widen our tool belts a little bit around ways that we can, um, support our kids more with that. Thank you. And this, there's some folks who really connected, myself included, with the what you mentioned about families creating their own values. 
And so this question I thought was great. What happens when your extended family or friends have different values than you and your family? How do you ensure that your own children know that you don't subscribe to those thoughts without putting those other people down? Um, I think that's really important to have those conversations with your kids, um, especially in today's political climate, we're finding that to be more and more. Um, I, I would have conversations with my kids like, okay, we are going, let's say we're going to grandma's house, right? These are our values in our house. What are our values? What do we believe that that's uh, right for us? How are we uh, showing up in the world? Um, grandma does not believe in that same ideology, right? That same value. So what are some of the things that we could say to grandma if she says something that makes us uncomfortable, right? How do we show up in a way that we are respectful and we love her, but that we're able to hold our own boundaries? I think it's really, it's really important that we teach our kids to be kind and compassion and we teach our kids to hold boundaries for themselves, right? To self-advocate in a lot of ways. And I think we do that by having these open dialogues and these open um, conversations with our kids continuously. We write down our core values. Like I am a big proponent of having them up on the refrigerator, having talking about them during family meetings, during dinner. Um, if our kids can't write the words, they could draw a picture that represents that core value. Um, because we need to know when, when things are not going well in our family, we have those core values to come back to. Like when I said that to you, it didn't, that didn't align with our core values. I'm very sorry for screaming at you. I'm very sorry for saying that to you. That wasn't right. Or when you are throwing a temper tantrum um, because you didn't want to leave Sally's house, right? Our core value is about respect. And I didn't feel respected at that time. So how do we now get back in our core line with our core values? Now, when they're two and three and four, they may not understand all of that, but you're laying the foundation for them so that they can um, advocate for themselves. They are very sure about what's important to you as a family. Um, and they're able to be compassionate and kind, but they're able to take that out into the world. Um, and I think role-playing it. What can you say if someone says this? What are some things that we've learned about our family that we can use when we're out in the real world? So I think um, repeating those core values often, talk about what those core values look like. Like what's the example of us being respectful? What can you do to show me that you're respectful? What can I do to show you that, that um, I respect you? So showing, talking about examples of what that looks like and then role playing what happens when you go out in the real world and people are stepping over those boundaries. I love that. That's so practical and yeah. <laughs> um, just so applicable across age group. And so I think as a last kind of um, you know, question or comment, how do you start that family values conversation with, say, a two or three or four year old? I think we don't give them enough credit, right? I think you can have core values about respect or honest, honesty, whatever those core values are. You, they may not understand that word, but they understand your actions. So you're going to be living those things, and then you're going to use the words out loud. Oh, you know, when you told me the truth, when you spilled the milk. Um, that was really showing me that you, you can practice honesty and honesty is so important to our family. Thank you for telling mommy the truth, right? So they may not know that word, but they'll know the action as you start to talk about it out loud and um, making clues when they're, when they're living those uh, values um, in your home, in their daily lives. I love that. Thank you so much. And my favorite part about this presentation and the resources in your book is just how one can take what seems like a really big task and really simplify it into the daily habits and conversations that families are already engaged in and probably don't even realize they, they've started to put in the work. And so I just love how, how you're able to connect all of that for us. I'm going to share my screen just so that folks can have um, some one last kind of note about how they can give us some feedback for tonight's session. Um, and so I will pull that up here. And I think I'm probably even got your face up still. And we just want to thank you first. Um, and also everybody for joining us this evening and over the last 
couple of um, sessions. It's been such a joy. And we really hope that um, for participants, you continue to reach out to us with questions and comments. And we hope that you see us in the ECE division as a resource for you. So we'd love your feedback. Please take a moment to fill out the survey. The link should be put in the chat there for you. Um, and please, you can see all the ways that you can engage with us. And we just hope that this isn't the end of our conversation, but really a beginning. And Dr. Baxley, we are yeah, full of so much gratitude for you. And we welcome you into our DCPS family. You are now one of us. Um, and we look forward to many more engagement opportunities with you in the future. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate being part of it. And um, I love the work that you guys are doing for families. Thank you. Oh, and one more thing, families, just for filling out the survey, you're going to be entered in a drawing to receive a bundle of really awesome children's books. So please make sure to fill that out. And thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Baxley. Thank you.